called Covering Egypt, Media and Politics in the Post-Mubarak Period. Uh, our second panel is uh, titled The Media, Human Rights, and Free Speech in Egypt. And I'm Karen Barkey, and I'm going to moderate. Uh, we have four speakers to this morning uh, that will be talking each about 20 minutes to the max. Is Sarah Leah Whitson, Executive Director, Middle East and North Africa at the Human uh, Rights Watch, Middle East and North Africa Division. And she works in 19 countries and with staff located in 10 different countries. Um, she has also written and has uh, published widely on human rights issues in the Los Angeles Times, Foreign Policy, New York Times, CNN, and many other outlets. So we will uh, go in this order, and I will give each speaker 20 minutes, and then we'll have a, uh, a discussion and question discussion session. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I prepared my marks, uh, remarks anticipating uh, uh, an audience of Columbia University students who may not uh, uh, be as enmeshed in the realities of Egypt as I suspect the audience uh, is here today, judging from some of the faces uh, I'm seeing. So I apologize if, if a lot of what I say is painfully obvious to many of you. Uh, but I think that the challenge that we're confronting on Egypt is that the reality of what's happening on the ground, the reality of the repression in Egypt since the overthrow of President Morsi uh, is not something that is apparent or obvious uh, to many policymakers, and that's not accidental. Um, it's not accidental because the new Egyptian government, the military-backed government, is investing tremendous resources uh, to uh, portray the current situation in Egypt uh, as one that is exclusively about terrorism. Uh, and obviously, as governments around the world know, there's no better way to justify abuses, there's no better way to justify repression, there's no better way to justify uh, absolute authoritarianism uh, than by the hoary old excuse of terrorism. Um, and it's no accident, uh, in fact, that there has been a very significant spike in terrorism in Egypt uh, since the overthrow uh, of President Morsi. Uh, I'm not sure what the explanation is for the linkage of these two. We know that the uh, military-backed government blames uh, President Morsi for releasing uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, extremist, uh, terrorist, Islamists from uh, prison uh, and blames them as the source of much of the terrorism uh, underway in the Sinai now, uh, but of course that uh, excuse has been extensively debunked uh, by those who documented that in fact the vast, vast, vast majority of those released from prison were released by the staff uh, before uh, President Morsi uh, came to power. Um, and the uh, uh, government's explanation for that is, well, of course we had to do that because they were convicted by military courts and we were trying to undo that. So it's sort of an endless cycle of uh, excuses uh, for uh, uh, the, the, the staff's responsibility, the military's responsibility uh, for uh, the spike in terrorism um, with an overwhelming, dominating narrative um, that the terrorism in the country, the violence in the country is the responsibility of the Muslim Brotherhood and its political party, the Freedom and Justice Party. And I think it's very important to see uh, the uh, the vast majority of the repression uh, in the country underway now uh, tied to that excuse and justification. Um, the problem, of course, is there's no evidence for this. Uh, there's no evidence that the government has offered uh, linking the Muslim Brotherhood to the terrorism and the violence uh, underway. Um, but this is the dominant narrative that we, as Human Rights Watch, and I think other human rights activists and organizations, both inside Egypt and outside Egypt, are trying to confront, um, uh, and, and we are uh, expending a lot of resources and efforts to document what's happening in Egypt right now, um, because it is in fact the worst we've seen in decades and decades. Uh, and the irony, of course, is at the same time that the PR agencies enlisted by the new Egyptian government uh, are trying to do their utmost to portray Egypt on a path to democracy or restoring peace and security, uh, and, and finding little cosmetic twists to highlight and trumpet 
Um, and again, the role of, uh, of Human Rights Watch is to expose uh, the reality, to expo expose the falsehoods. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's uh, impossible to talk about the situation now in Egypt, of course, outside the context of the Arab uprisings. Um, and what, what you know, casts the greatest shadow on, on these uprisings, of course, is the tragedy in Syria. So I have to start by saying that the 160,000 dead uh, in Syria, the unparalleled, uh, unprecedented violence we're seeing in the country now, um, is uh, uh, something that dominates uh, and, and overshadows everything else that's happening in the region. Um, but what Human Rights Watch does, and, 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 and what's very important to do, is to not let that be the only thing we talk about, because that would just be all too convenient uh, to ignore the repression that we're seeing uh, in uh, <coughs> countries like Egypt. And I must say that uh, in terms of what's unfolded in the past three years in the region, uh, Egypt is perhaps the greatest disappointment. Um, the greatest disappointment because unlike uh, in Syria, where there really wasn't uh, any uh, period of hope, uh, any period of success uh, for those who were seeking democracy and freedom, um, what we have in Egypt, of course, is a short, brief period of a transition to democracy of the first democratically elected president in the country in fair and free elections where we actually didn't know who was going to win. Uh, and that, as you all know, is rare not only in Egypt, but rare in all of the Middle East. Um, and so that, that level of disappointment, that level of frustration is one I know that, that, that Egyptian activists are, are, are experiencing, but everyone around the world who was watching what was effectively the first televised revolution, you know, minute by minute, blow by blow, there's a global sense of disappointment uh, in, in what happened in Egypt. Um, but since then, what have we had? Um, we have uh, a, a, a military uh, and security apparatus with apparently a singular focus, and that is to destroy the political opposition in the country, uh, to destroy the party of the political opposition, the Freedom and Justice Party, uh, and to destroy it, really, as we're seeing, uh, by use of violence and extreme oppression uh, to a level that we have not seen, not only in the past administration, uh, but in the, the recent modern history of the past hundred years uh, in Egypt. Um, it, it's, it's impossible uh, uh, to speak, for example, only about the persecution of journalists, which we've heard about today, without first starting um, with the irretrievable uh, harms that the Egyptian security forces uh, have committed uh, since the overthrow of President Morsi, which is the killing of over 2,000 uh, protesters, mostly pro-Muslim Brotherhood protesters, but protesters who were protesting a military coup, uh, regardless of their support for one party or another. Um, and, and what we documented in these killings, and I think it's exceedingly important to emphasize this, um, is that the uh, killings were, by and large, indiscriminate killings uh, of protesters, but also deliberate killings of protesters. Um, this is not just about an excessive use of police force uh, in, uh, in demonstrations. This is just about failures in safely and securing a dispersal of protesters, which is, again, what the most the government uh, might want to characterize this as. Um, what our investigations have documented uh, is the deliberate killing of protesters, in some cases injured protesters, uh, who we have testimony were executed in cold blood. Uh, we have wide-scale indiscriminate fire by helicopters, uh, by police forces, security snipers, basically randomly shooting uh, at thousands and thousands of assembled protesters, uh, regardless of where the bullets may come. And what we've also found in our extensive documentation and investigation of the protests since uh, June 30 is that the government's claim of wide-scale violence by the protesters uh, is something we just simply can't find evidence for. We have absolutely found evidence that some protesters were armed, uh, that some protesters did commit violence. We know that uh, over uh, 10 uh, police were killed, uh, particularly in the uh, dispersal of the Rabah and Nanda Square protests. Uh, but the extent of the violence uh, uh, that the government has claimed uh, is nowhere near in evidence, and this is based on interviews uh, with over uh, 100 uh, uh, witnesses, doctors, uh, uh, some security forces themselves, uh, journalists, uh, medics who were on the scene, and so forth, and the government's uh, own uh, claim.
claims are not supported by any evidence. Of course, given the very, very small number of weapons uh, they themselves were able to document, and of course, uh, uh, what is effectively a small number of security forces killed uh, relative to the number of protesters killed. Um, now, I say this is irretrievable, uh, not only because of the fact that these uh, 2,000 people who have been killed uh, will never have a second chance, uh, that's clear, uh, but also uh, because uh, it, it seems that the government has no interest uh, in any form of real accountability for these crimes. Uh, they have announced uh, and, and have apparently started uh, another fact-finding commission, uh, but like the two fact-finding commissions that preceded it, uh, 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 both in uh, the wake of Mubarak's overthrow by the SCAF and also under President Morsi, um, we don't expect the results of this fact-finding committee uh, to ever see the light of day. Um, and much more significantly than any fact-finding committee, or even the government-appointed National Council on Human Rights reports, which did find uh, the excessive use of force by security forces and wrongdoing by security forces in the, in the uh, dispersal of the Baba Natha and other protests in uh, post-June 30. Um, but there has not been a single police officer interrogated, uh, much less prosecuted, uh, for uh, these killings uh, of, of protesters. And so what we have is an unbelievable culture cycle uh, 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 permissiveness of impunity. Kill thousands of protesters, don't go to jail. Nothing happens. Uh, in fact, what we see is a government who has the temerity to build a monument in Rabat Square to honor the security forces uh, for their brazen violations of human rights, for their brazen disregard of Egyptian life uh, in, in, uh, in the dispersal of those protests. So this should give you a flavor of where the military-backed government's mood is right now uh, in terms of really accountability, recognizing that maybe some things we didn't do right and we'll try to do it better. No, there's none of that. Um, in addition to, uh, to their killings, of course, uh, is the wide-scale massive persecution of Muslim Brotherhood supporters, Muslim Brotherhood party members. Uh, according to the government's own figures, uh, security forces have detained at least 16,000 people. While the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights, and I'll mention them later, uh, has credibly documented over 20,000 arrests uh, since July 3 and, and up to December 31st. Um, these numbers have only increased uh, because, for example, on January 25, uh, the authorities arrested over 1,000 protesters, uh, according to the Interior Ministry. Many of those detained, we know, uh, have been mounted up solely as a result of exercising their rights to assemble. Uh, uh, to associate, to express themselves, and of course merely for membership in the Muslim Brotherhood, which is now illegal. Uh, the police have also arrested uh, uh, the majority of the high-level and much of the mid-level leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, across the country, uh, including uh, government officials who were exclusively involved in politics or communications. Um, and we know that the prosecutors have ordered these pretrial detentions. Uh, most of the pending investigation is, is the sort of formal uh, uh, procedure for it on charges that include, in almost every case, incitement uh, to violence. You know, a sort of a very broad catch-all that merely by participating in a demonstration or protest, you were somehow inciting the violence that might have occurred in a demonstration. And of course, the other big catch-all, illegal public assembly. Um, the prosecutors routinely, sort of on autopilot, renew these pretrial detentions, which are only supposed to last a very short period of time, on the basis of very little evidence, basically mass evidence, uh, that's not particular to any individual who's been detained. Effectively, uh, detaining thousands and thousands and thousands of people arbitrarily uh, in, in uh, Egypt's teeming prisons. The cases that have gone to trial, because many cases have, have been riddled with serious due process uh, violations, including, as I know now that many of you are aware of, these mass trials that most significantly have failed to assess the individual guilt of each defendant, yet resulted in lengthy sentences uh, and even the death penalty. The, the most prominent of these cases, but not the only ones, uh, were the, the sentences by Judge Saad Youssef in Minya. Uh, now, of course, he's called the Hanging Judge or the Butcher of Minya. Uh, for his sentence of over 1,200 people to death in two mass trials. He commuted the death sentences 
of uh, uh, most of the first batch, we know that, to life imprisonment, very generous. Uh, and we expect the same to happen in the second batch, but this again gives you a flavor of what the Egyptian government and the Egyptian judiciary is at. Uh, these are sham trials. Uh, the defendants, the vast majority of the defendants, were not present in these cases. The vast majority had no lawyers. Uh, and again, uh, for example, in the first trial, 529 people sentenced to death for the killing of one police officer. Not one single defendant uh, was shown evidence or presented evidence as to what they did to actually cause the death of that uh, police officer. No individual finding of guilt in a death penalty case. If this isn't evidence of a judiciary seriously gone amok, if this doesn't give lie to the notion of an independent judiciary over which the government uh, has no control, which is what the uh, government's representatives will often claim, then I don't know what is. As I mentioned, the Muslim Brotherhood has been declared a terrorist organization, and both it and its political party, the Freedom and Justice Party, have been banned. Uh, the government designated the uh, Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization on December 25, um, and froze the assets of its senior leaders, put a hold on its bank accounts and the accounts of over a thousand NGOs linked to the Brotherhood, uh, and has initiated uh, procedures to seize the assets uh, of over 140 Brotherhood-affiliated NGOs. The problem, of course, is where's the evidence? Where's the evidence to show um, that the Muslim Brotherhood and these uh, 1,000 NGOs have been involved in a single terrorist attack? The allegations are there. You know, I think uh, every Egyptian government official can cite chapter and verse of incredible claims uh, of, of the Muslim Brotherhood's participation, endorsement, support of terrorism. But what again is missing is the actual evidence. And state-controlled Egyptian TV and media have run amok. Uh, they are even run, running wanted ads showing images of young Muslim Brotherhood members urging people to call a hotline to report them uh, as Muslim Brotherhood members. There is a lynch mob mentality, there is a witch hunt uh, against people who are members of a political party, people who are members of an association and an organization, uh, casually branded uh, as terrorists, inviting white scale persecution. Uh, and the government, of course, has closed down any TV and print media affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist currents. Uh, the government hasn't been satisfied uh, with taking down uh, the, the Islamist opposition, uh, of course the, the Salafist opposition uh, entirely exempted from this. Uh, but as, uh, as I think has already been touched on, the secular opposition, uh, the, the leaders of the April 6th Youth Movement, uh, leaders of uh, NGOs have also been targeted. Uh, because I think the message that's coming uh, from the Egyptian government is not only that Islamist opposition, Islamist dissent will not be tolerated, but that no dissent, no opposition uh, will be tolerated. Just today, uh, the government raided the offices of the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights, which has been rigorously documented the numbers of people arrested uh, in prisons. Um, and this follows a November raid on their offices. Uh, where it arrested six uh, of their members. <clears throat> uh, it's prosecuting the leaders of the April 6th Youth Movement. We saw some of the pictures of these uh, movements. Uh, and we've heard, we know, that three NGOs uh, have had their bank accounts shut. Yesterday, the government uh, sentenced Mahinu uh, al Musti, uh, who's a prominent activist in Alexandria, who has done great work, not only on uh, behalf of political activists and detainees in Egypt, uh, but on behalf of Syrian refugees who've been detained, and, and she has been sort of at the forefront uh, of, uh, of Syrian refugees. And she was sentenced to six years in prison, uh, along with nine other activists, for violating the new uh, uh, draconian assembly law. Basically, for participating in the very same kinds of demonstrations that brought down Mubarak and eventually brought in the military government. Uh, I won't mention again, because I know you have uh, the uh, imprisonment of uh, uh, the other April 6th uh, activists and, uh, uh, who you know, have played a key role in organizing the anti mubarak demonstrations. Uh, I know that you've already touched on the fact that academics uh, and activists like Amr Hamzawi and one of our own conference participants, Imad Shippen, have been uh, subject to travel bans and there are cases pending against them. 
uh, because they have insulted the judiciary. Uh, in uh, Hamzawi's case, uh, for uh, tweeting uh, a question or tweeting for and deeming a particular case uh, to be politicized. This uh, situation in Egypt has struck Human Rights Watch very personally and directly. Uh, we have shut down our office in Cairo uh, since uh, 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 January uh, because we have found the security situation an untenable risk uh, for our staff and our colleagues in Egypt. Um, we had filed for registration uh, in 2006 and like many other international NGOs, uh, were in the state of permanent limbo awaiting uh, our uh, legalization. But in the current climate of repression, uh, in light of the fact that Al Jazeera journalists have been prosecuted merely for talking to me members of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, we felt that it was just too risky for our own staff uh, to continue to do their job, which of course uh, includes talking to victims of human rights abuses, uh, which today uh, are, are represented very prominently by me members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, the targeting of Al Jazeera uh, uh, is, as, as has been noted, uh, uh, not an accident. It's uh, been identified, labeled uh, as pro-Muslim Brotherhood, and particularly, which you know, was fine for a, a, a long time, of course, uh, until uh, the government decided that the Muslim Brotherhood was now a terrorist organization. And so now any information <coughs> that was documenting their repression, that was documenting the killings of protesters, was, has been deemed by the government as contributing uh, to terrorism uh, and contributing to what is uh, against the law in Egypt. And I'll touch on the law uh, in, in, in a few moments. Uh, but the prosecution of these journalists uh, is, is not just a vendetta against uh, Al Jazeera, uh, but it's a message to all journalists and activists in the country. Toe the line or else. Um, this, in several cases, I, I should note that journalists have been shot or injured for attending the protests. Um, and, you know, just, again, something that, you know, just is, is baffling to even hear, but in response to the outrage of the use of live ammunition at these demonstrations, um, and particularly in the wake of Mayada Ashraf's death, <clears throat> who was a, a journalist who was killed by a bullet to her head, and I should note that in so many cases of these killings of protesters and journalists attending protests, um, the deaths have been by bullets to the head, uh, neck, or shoulders, which in, in typical law enforcement parlance uh, indicates an intent to kill and also suggests shooting from high, uh, from high platforms where when you're pointing down, that's where you're going to strike a journalist. But what was the government's response? The Interior Ministry proposed to provide journalists uh, with bulletproof vests. Uh, not a moratorium on using live ammunition, uh, but encouraging journalists to use bulletproof vests when they go to demonstrations. What does this signal about how the government intends to police demonstrations? You know, it's, it's ironic, of course, that the new constitution, uh, which passed in January by a very old-style 98% vote, um, was drafted in a process that was, you know, even less ex inclusive than the one Morsi organized, and of course this was one of the main criticisms of Morsi's constitution. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear, uh, uh, in light of the great PR value that the government is trying to make of the new constitution, uh, that it's not really worth the paper it's written on. If these are the kinds of abuses that a government can carry out with a spanking new constitution that affirms all kinds of human rights protections. Uh, for example, uh, the constitution, uh, Article 70, uh, sets out very strong protections for freedom of the press declaring that freedom of the press and printing, along with paper, visual, audio, and digital, digital distribution is guaranteed. Uh, and Article 71 says that no one shall be imprisoned for crimes committed by way of publication or the public nature thereof. And yet, uh, the government continues to use the penal code, uh, the criminal law, which doesn't uh, have any relation, it seems, to the Constitution. Uh, and, for example, in Article 102, allows the government to imprison people uh, if they disseminate false news, and it's up to the prosecutor to decide what's true or false, uh, or uh, excites uh, public, uh, the public, um, or disturbs public order, or spreads horror. And of course, when you disseminate pictures of dead demonstrators with the brains hanging out of their heads, certainly that will elicit horror. Uh, it elicits a natural instinct of horror, uh, and this apparently is sufficient 
uh, in Egypt for journalists to land in jail because these are the very charges that journalists are facing. Um, uh, again, and, and, and just to go on with this theme, the, the Egyptian government is not satisfied with destroying the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and its members inside Egypt, with destroying political dissent inside Egypt. It is now launching an aggressive campaign uh, to seek out Muslim Brotherhood members and supporters outside Egypt. We already know that Saudi and the Emirates have joined on the bandwagon, themselves passing laws outlawing uh, membership in the Muslim Brotherhood, outlawing communication with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, party outside of Egypt, uh, and, and, and jailing uh, uh, members, uh, jailing people in these countries uh, for having sympathies or associations with the Muslim Brotherhood. They are putting tremendous pressure on, on Kuwait uh, to do this, which has so far resisted. Uh, they are uh, virtually on, on breaking their relations with Qatar, not only for Al Jazeera, but because of the, the fact that there are uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt who found uh, exile in, in Qatar. Um, but now they have managed to uh, persuade the British government to launch an investigation of the Muslim Brotherhood inside the UK uh, and for reasons that we can't quite understand despite our repeated questions to the uh, British government. Uh, appointing, of all people, the former ambassador of the United Kingdom to Saudi Arabia uh, to lead this investigation. Uh, we know that Canada has said that they are going to initiate this sort of an investigation inside Canada. And of course, <coughs> uh, Khaled al uh, uh is a, a Canadian resident uh, and his wife is a Canadian citizen. And so there are uh, a number of Muslim Brotherhood supporters in Canada. And we know uh, from our meetings and talks with people in the U.S. government that there is Tremendous encouragement that the U.S. government should also uh, launch this sort of inquiry. And as I, I think people have touched on, and I'll wrap up, I hope I haven't spoken too long, um, uh, the, the, the U.S. approach on, on, on Egypt, the U.S. approach to the repression in Egypt, has been, for short of a, for lack of a better term, a bit schizophrenic. Um, the challenge, of course, is that uh, Egypt doesn't really matter much to the United States outside of its happenstance border with Israel. Uh, and pursuant to the Camp David agreements, uh, uh, Egypt plays a vital, vital role uh, of, of uh, maintaining the border, uh, not only with Gaza, but along Sinai and Israel. Uh, and it's that critical piece, it's the terrorism element of it, uh, that keeps the U.S. tied up in absolute knots about what to do in terms of its military aid to Egypt. And that is why we've seen the halting back and forth, uh, initially suspending uh, some of the military aid to Egypt, uh, recently releasing some of the military aid to Egypt under the terrorism bracket. Uh, and now what we know is a real uh, debate and argument uh, inside the, the U.S. administration about whether or not to resume, uh, return to business as usual, uh, return the gravy train of military aid back uh, to the government, uh, again, primarily tied to concerns about security of the Sinai, uh, uh, over flight rights, uh, and so forth. And so, ironically, while the military-backed government continues to feed a media frenzy of Obama being a Muslim Brotherhood supporter and the U.S. government being Muslim Brotherhood supporters, in fact, they are back on the paycheck uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, military. With that, I'll uh, wrap up. I'm sorry if I've spoken too long, and I'll turn it back to you. actually open it to questions right away because I was told, Sarah, that you have to leave. So actually, if you have questions for... President Morsi, uh, uh, not just over his interference with the judiciary, but over uh, um, Sue's shootings or his attempts, as you put it, to bully the media, um, and a narrative that contributed to the delegitimization of Morsi uh, which uh, I think Human Rights Watch participated in, sadly. Um, I think that, you know, I, I can only speak for, for the work of our division and the work of, uh, that we do. Uh, I think we call it as it is. Uh, I think that we document abuses uh, as we find them, and it's a fact-based organization. Um, of course abuses took place under, under Morsi. Um, you know, we know uh, uh, that, that demonstrators were abused uh, at the presidential palace. Uh, 
uh, and um, that at least two uh, of the protesters who were killed, I believe there were 11 killed, uh, died, died at the hands uh, of pro-Brotherhood uh, protesters. Um, we, know that, uh, uh, we know that journalists were uh, jailed also uh, under President Morsi. We have... I will... Uh, sorry, I, I mean... Let her finish, please. I, Let I, her I, finish. I, I think this information is available on our website, and I'm, happy, and I'm happy to share it with you afterwards. I don't have it with me. This isn't what I was coming to talk about. I was talking about what the current situation is. Um, but I can also tell you that when we now, uh, when we criticize the military-backed government, um, there are hundreds of stories in the Egyptian media that accuse us of being pro-Muslim Brotherhood. Um, we document abuses by the Israeli government and we are pro-Hamas. Uh, we document Hamas's indiscriminate killings uh, uh, it, or indiscriminate rocket fire and we are pro-Israel. Uh, we are the Zionists, we are the terrorists. I mean, you know, as far as, as, as the work we do in the 19 countries of the Middle East that we cover, um, we document the abuses as we see them. Um, if you would like me to say that the abuses under Morsi were not comparable to the abuses we're seeing now under the military-backed government, the facts speak for themselves. That's painfully obvious. Just as it's painfully obvious that the abuses by the Israeli government against the Palestinians are you know, the vast majority of the crimes committed, uh, or that the abuses by the Syrian government are the vast majority of the abuses committed as opposed to the Syrian opposition. And yet every day we receive an email accusing us of being pro-Syrian opposition or accusing us of being pro-Assad. So I believe I stand by the facts, and I stand by our documentation of the facts and our assessment of the facts as we see them. Uh, can, I, can I just... Uh, Jamal wants to say something, and then we have a question there that I want to also... Get. Just add in to this, if you don't mind. I think the difference here with regards to, um, or, or at least my understanding maybe of, of what David was pointing to, isn't necessarily an idea of double standards. I think personally there was a genuine misunderstanding when it came to assessing uh, events under Morsi's presidency and that people were actually convinced, him included, that he ran the country. When actually what was taking place was taking place by the very same security forces. So in my view, the crimes that were committed under Morsi weren't committed, ultimately politically he will hold responsibility as the president. However, the real responsibility of the perpetrators are the very same people. So the judiciary, his attempts to try and cleanse the judiciary were viewed to be an attempt of this brotherhoodization of the state, which obviously never really manifested itself because the guy was removed quicker than you could, you know, grab a toy from a little kid. Um, but the understanding who was behind it and understanding actually that the institutions were constantly the same institutions and that's why any criticism directed towards the police or the military and so forth now is the same criticism directed towards them prior to that. They're exactly the same people. I think uh, we will release you so okay. you can go and thank you very thank much you. for a wonderful Sorry. presentation. Thank you. Thank you.